We are here today in Essex Center at beautiful Chapin Orchard with owner Phil Murdoch. Thanks for being here, Phil. Oh, my pleasure. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to own the orchard? And well, I was just actually talking to somebody recently and um, this is our 20th season. So we've been here for uh, 20 years, which I think is about the time, about the same amount of time that Nick and Bridget um, had the orchard and mm -hmm. operated the mm -hmm. orchard. Mm -hmm. It was around a 20 year time frame when they um, bought it from the uh, Chapins. I see. Um, Barb's folks. My wife knew Barb Chapin through the uh, school system mm -hmm. and she knew that she had some land over here and she was just starting to get it engineered to, uh, to uh, start selling off some parcels. And then I happened to see a sign here. It was a day in April of 2000 and it was beautiful, 60 degree April day, not a, nothing was green. It was mm -hmm. still, everything was down, but you could see every rock and everything. And I walked up, I walked the perimeter of the property and just said, oh my gosh, it, it was one of those lightning moments that kind of mm -hmm. hit you. And, and then, then the rest, as they say, is history where it was a, it was a situation where I said, we got to keep it going. Oh, I had no interest in not keeping it going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, so immediately, and I think Nick and Bridget really wanted to have sell it to somebody that was going to keep the operation in apples and not develop it and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. so I immediately never thought of doing anything other than that. And, um, but then the tough thing was how do you do that as a, with a full-time job and how do you so, keep it going? And so he, Nick, you know, gave me some advice. He happened, he knew a guy that named Jim Bovey who um, was a forester and lived in Jericho with his family. And um, so for the first 10, years it was uh i wasn't there a lot because of well first of all our first apple season was 9 11. Oh gosh and uh, so 11 days into our first apple season um i i was uh, very active and busy at the guard and that was killing me because i i couldn't just not i hated not being here but jim had it going and uh and still works uh, to keep it going today and growing the apples so Terrific. Now, how many acres do you have? How many varieties of apples? It's um, almost 35 acres. There's about 30 varieties. Um, I've learned um, all at this point. I didn't know one from the other. It took me several <laughs> years to understand which tree was which because, you know, you look over here on this old orchard and this, these are some of the original trees from the, you know, 1920, the late 20s, wow. 1930s. Some of the big classics that you see that were mm. planted by uh, um, the Chapin boys. Um, back in the early 1900s and then. Now, how, how many apples do you sell versus how much cider do you sell? Is there some sort of breakdown as percentage wise? Yeah, um, processed about, apples well, it, the simple math is about half of our crop goes to pick your own. Okay. And that's the model. It's where families come and, and enjoy the experience, come out and mm -hmm. enjoy this view, oh, enjoy yeah. the farm, get out in the space and, and um, get out of their neighborhoods and out of the offices and they come out here into the country and um, down that dirt road and yeah. all the stress goes away and they come out here. So we pick the other half and out of that, about half goes into cider okay. and about, um, and the other half uh, we'll put in our store here at the retail area and uh, for people that can't go out and pick or don't have time or whatever. And uh, so that's kind of the simple breakdown of it. Now tell me a little bit about the financing behind all this. Yeah, we are, in current, we are in current use, so okay. that helps with the property taxes. Yeah. Um, so how does this fit into um, what's going on in Essex now as far as um, economically, um, even governmentally? You know, we've, we've got talk again about a merger. Do you have any sense of how a tax shift could affect your business? Well, so I would say, number one, um, no one wants to pay more taxes. But once you're beyond inflation and they're going up uh, as a percentage, a higher percentage each year, um, that's not sustainable. That is a concern. I don't think it's going to drive me out of this in my lifetime, but what about right. my kids? Right. And sure. um, how are they going to be able to afford this? And, you know, you look at what's happening to the dairy farms in Vermont, and as has been for many, yes. many years and continues to happen, is they sell a product for less than it costs them to make the product. And that's what's happening to the Vermont dairy farms. And so, or has happened over the years. And, um, you know, down the road was one of the last uh, dairy farms in Essex. And, 
he's no longer in you know selling milk right. and um, he's out of business you have some unique products here right you don't pasteurize your cider we don't and a lot yeah. of other folks do right so right. that's something that if you don't want pasteurization you come here right, right? I mean, and people come from a long ways I'm to sure get our cider do. it's I'm really sure it's do. amazing and um, and because we sell on site and we're a small operation we don't have to pasteurize based on, uh, on the right. on the regulations do you do any integrated pest management what, 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 what are you putting you, on the apples you, to you said it it, that, that's the key, integrated pest management. That's exactly what we do. Okay. So as a small pick your own operation, we can accept a certain amount of blemishes. So it's that battle against mother nature. So number one, I can accept some blemishes because people will buy them. Some people will drop them, okay. but most people will buy them. And you can make them into cider too. And right? we'll use I them mean, for cider, that okay. kind of stuff. So, you know, so we've got that going for us. And that's where, to me, I preach, or I tell people, I don't preach, but I tell people, you know that that's that's the difference between a small local operation mm -hmm. versus a massive large operation which sure. if you're massive and you're large and you're wholesaling you have to spray monday wednesday friday Ooh. monday wednesday friday Ooh. you got to keep it going because you're so big but what we can do is we can afford to not spray mm -hmm. we can spray afford, afford to spray less yep. because we can go out and scout so it's in everybody's best interest to do as little as you can um, okay. For the environment, for the people, and for the Pocket. for the pocketbook. Sure, sure. So that's the neat thing about a small, and that's something I learned. I didn't really re realize that till we came here, was the IPM, Integrated Pest Management. You know, people ask a lot of times. You know, organic. How come you're not organic? How come you don't? We can't say you're organic. We went to a Apple meeting several years ago, and there was an extension. One of the speakers was an extension expert from uh, from New Hampshire. And somebody in the crowd asked him a question and said, um, can you actually grow an organic apple in Vermont hmm. or in New England? And the guy goes, not if you want to sell it. Yeah, now you mentioned your kids earlier. Anybody yeah. in your family looking to take this on or did they help at this point? Um, yeah, they help. Um, my son, I have a son and daughter that live locally that'll be out here this fall That's a lot working terrific. here and helping. They, they're intrigued by it. Um, you know they're in the middle of their careers at this point so i'm gonna the goal is to try to keep things going until they're able to ease yes. into a little bit more sure. and then the whole the perfect scenario would be is i could drive the tractor and mow grass there you go sounds and, good and, to and, me and, and, <laughs> and drive the hay wagon and, and greet okay. people well it sounds like there's a future for chapin orchard and yeah. uh, i'm glad there's a present i look forward very much to picking my own this year good. and drinking your cider and well the goal my goal is to leave it better than we found it um nick and bridget did a great job yeah of uh, setting us up and setting this up and setting the foundation of it. And then hopefully Jim and I and Helen have brought it to another level and sure, um, okay. the next generation can bring it to the next level. Terrific. But the goal is to keep it going and keep it, uh, keep it open, keep it active, keep it in apples. And uh, it's a people's orchard, it really is. Well.